can turn along with me tonight to the Old Testament, the book of Numbers, book of Numbers, so the fourth book of our Old Testament, uh, chapter 13 tonight. So we pick up where we left off uh, last month, so uh, we're in chapter 13 and 14, Lord willing. Uh, we'll see if I bit off more than I can chew, but trying to give us a good, uh, good little pace here, a uh, good summary uh, going through the story, the narrative of uh, the story of the Israelites in the wilderness as they were with the Lord. Uh, and the Lord was with them. And so uh, tonight, Numbers chapters 13 and 14. Now, uh, last month we saw, beginning at chapter 10, verse 11, uh, the journey of Israel in the wilderness and through the wilderness began. And then here in chapters 13 and 14, we read of these spies. There are 12 of them. Uh, they enter the land to scope it out, to see uh, what it was like. Uh, we hear the report when they came back to Moses. And then most importantly, we hear the Lord's response to their report, and we'll see to their faithlessness. Uh, along with creating and worshiping the golden calf back in the story of Exodus, chapters 32 through 34, uh, this faithless report of the 10 spies, we'll see there's 12 of them, but only 10 of them are or a, a ten of them are, are faithless, only two of them aren't. So along with the, the golden calf incident, Exodus 32 through 4, uh, this incident of the faithless spies, these are the two sins that are mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, which is after the 40 years of the wandering, so the final generation that goes into the promised land. There are two sins that are mentioned uh, from, uh, by the Lord to his people as the reasons why the Lord threatened to annihilate Israel. Golden calf, first of all, and the faithless report of the spies. And so the Lord threatens to wipe out Israel, and in fact, he threatened his own covenant, right? He threatens his own promise that he made all the way back to Father Abraham. So this is serious stuff. Uh, when the Lord threatens in such a way, we should really take notice, and it only happens twice in the entirety of the Old Testament story. So important stuff, important stuff for us to know uh, and to learn. Uh, but also in these stories, we're going to see uh, for us, uh, for our benefits, that we learn here how to follow the Lord. Uh, we learn here how to follow the Lord's lead, uh, and we'll focus on that towards the end uh, in just a bit. So uh, let's uh, open our Bibles up again to Numbers 13 and 14, and uh, hear and listen and see what the Lord uh, wants us to know. Uh, so the story opens up. You should have that sermon notes page or that uh, study notes page, whatever you want to call it. You have that in front of you? We all have that? Okay. So that study notes page there, you'll have the outline. Uh, the story begins here with the Lord's command. The Lord's command to send in the spies. So look at chapter 13 at verse number one, where the Lord spoke to Moses. And we've seen in the book of Numbers that that little phrase there, the Lord spoke to Moses, uh, it's like a tell. Uh, telltale sign of, uh, of the book of Numbers. The Lord spoke uh, to Moses, so many times before. Here's the command. Look at verse uh, number two, uh, verses one and two. Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one of them a chief among them. Now, notice that verb send there uh, in verse number two. Send men. Uh, literally, send for yourself is what the Lord tells Moses. Send for yourself. So uh, the, the ESV translation doesn't quite bring out the sense of what's going on here. Send for yourself, the Lord says. Why does he say that? Why does he speak that way? Well, in Deuteronomy again, chapter number 1, verse 22, verse 23, verse 37. So Deuteronomy chapter 1 towards the end of that chapter, Moses reminds the generation that came into the promised land, whose parents are the ones who were faithless, he reminds them that they, their forefathers, their foremothers, their parents and their grandparents, they demanded that he, Moses, send in the spies. So the people wanted to send the spies, and they told Moses, and Moses acquiesced to sending in the spies. And so he tells Moses, the Lord then acquiesces in a sense, and he says, send for yourself these men. Why? 
Notice again what the verse says. He's reminding them, and it makes sense that this is how it should be translated, send for yourself, because God says, I'm giving the land to the people of Israel. I'm giving the land to the people of Israel. He's already said this, like all the way back to Abraham. And he's been saying this throughout the generations, that he's going to give them a land that is uh, a land that's flowing with milk and honey. They didn't earn it. They didn't deserve it. They did nothing uh, to, to attain it. God gives it to them. And if God gives it to them, that should be the end of the story. That should be the end of the story. They should simply believe. They should simply embrace this promise. But they come to Moses, according to Deuteronomy chapter 1, and they, they tell Moses, send, us, uh, send spies in to find out if it's a safe place for us to go. And so God says, send for yourself. Send for yourself men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to them. These men shall be uh, uh, from each tribe of their fathers. You shall send a man, every one of them, uh, a chief among them. So they're already full of doubt. They're already full of doubt here. Uh, they haven't even left Mount Sinai hardly, and they're already full of doubt. Send in spies. Is it safe for us? Are these bad guys? Are they good guys? Is it really a land that flows with milk and honey? Or is it another place like this, desert and desolation? Remember the last time we saw there's no meat, there's no water, there's no bread, uh, and now we're going to see there's not even a grave for me to be laid in. So send spies. And so Moses acquiesces, the Lord acquiesces, and so Moses sends them in, verse 3 tells us, from that wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the people of Israel. And then comes in verse uh, 4 through 16, a list of the 12 names of these men uh, from each of those 12 tribes. Uh, these men, mentioned in verse 2, uh, the Hebrew term is anashim, uh, and uh, this can be uh, an important man. Uh, it's used, for example, in Genesis 34 of men who sit at the city gate. That's the city council. You sit at a city gate. That was the, the gathering place. And so the important men, the, the mighty men, uh, the Anashim, they, they meet there. And so send these important men. Uh, they're, they're not military spies then, you see. Uh, they're not going in to find out if they can win this battle and they can take them on right now. No, they're going in as sort of representatives to test and to try and to see uh, if what the Lord said was really true. Was the Lord really faithful, right? So the, the story is emphasizing their disbelief, their unbelief, their unfaithfulness. They're trying to go and, and look with their own eyes. You know, has what, uh, is what God said to us really, really going to be the case? Note the inclusion in that little list there. You probably noticed, recognize only two names. Uh, Caleb from the tribe of Judah in verse number 6. Uh, Caleb comes from the Hebrew Kelev, uh, which means a dog. And uh, it's, a, it's a metaphor for a submissive person, just like, uh, you know, we, I don't think Ramon's this way, but uh, Valkyrie, at least, you come over to my house and uh, Valkyrie will, he'll, he'll bark, and then as soon as uh, he barks, once or twice, and you just simply stand there. He's going to roll over on his back and be, com be a complete submissive uh, ball of hair and nothing, right? Uh, so a, a dog was a metaphor for obedience. And so Caleb, he, he's called, his name means dog. And so, uh, in other words, he's an obedient servant of the Most High God. Uh, and then also, also notice the inclusion of Hosea uh, from the tribe of Ephraim in verse number 8. Uh, Hosea means he saved. Uh, Moses, though, calls him, look at verse 16. What does Moses call him? Yeah, Yehoshua, right? Joshua, uh, which means the Lord saves. So who is the he who saves? The Lord and only the Lord. So you see those names listed. Two of them are recognizable, Caleb and Joshua. They're going to be the important men uh, in the story. So Moses sends them out to spy the lamb, and he gives them a commandment, notice, uh, verses 17 and following, uh, go up into the, into the Negev. This is the, the, the arid, dry, southern part of Judah. So if you look at a map of the Promised Land, this is the very far south, uh, the Negev. Uh, and go up into the hill country and see what the land uh, is. They should have trusted, though. Okay, so just keep this in mind. They should have trusted the Lord's promise that it actually is going to be a place that flows with milk and honey. And whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, should that matter? Should it matter? 
If there's a lot of them or, or only a few of them, are they strong, are they weak? It shouldn't matter. The Lord's on their side. He's already wiped out the Pharaoh's armies. He can't wipe out some people in the hill country on the desert, right? So again, it's Moses is telling them to do this because he's acquiescing to their, to their faithlessness. And whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, they shouldn't need this verification. They didn't need to send these anashim, these city councilors, these important mighty men. And whether the cities that they dwell in are, are camps or strongholds, right? So it's like the list just keeps getting longer and longer and longer. And whether the land is rich or poor, whether there are trees in it or not. Are you catching on now, right? Like all the things that God has already said. Don't worry about these armies, their cities, who cares? Uh, it doesn't matter how many there are, how, how, how great they are, how tall they are, how giant they are. It's a place that is flowing with milk and honey. Go, it's yours. And so he says, be of good courage, which has sort of been from the get-go, which Joshua and Caleb are going to counsel. And bring in, Moses says, some of the, the fruit of the land. Uh, the time was the season of the first ripe grapes, verse number 20. So the Lord's promised the land, okay? The Lord has promised this land to them. And no obstacle stands in their way with the Lord on their side. But they doubt. They doubt. And so they demand that the spies go in uh, and acquiesce to their request. And the Lord does this. The Lord accommodates himself to their stupid, sinful request. Uh, sometimes God does that with us, doesn't he? Sometimes God does that with us. Lord, I know I'm supposed to follow you where you're leading, but can you just reconfirm again, Lord? The marching orders, the charge, the commands. Oh, and while you're at it, Lord, would you just give me a little sign, right? Just give me a little sign, you know. No, no biggie, just a small one. Sometimes the Lord does this. Uh, he leads us, he guides us, and he gives us clear direction in his word, but yet we still doubt him, we still hesitate. But yet the Lord comes in the fullness of times, and, and he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and daily follow me. We shouldn't hesitate when Jesus calls us to follow him. There's no need for more confirmations and there's no need for signs. He simply says it. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, follow me. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Follow him, hear him, believe him, listen to him. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow after me. So, loved ones, let's learn to follow the Lord. Amen? Now, the story continues with the spies. Notice their deeds, their words, their deeds uh, and their words. Verses 21 to 33 of chapter 13. Uh, note their deeds, right? Their works, the things they're doing here. Verses 21 through 24. Uh, and so, as Moses commands them, uh, they go up. They spy out the land, verse 21 says, uh, and they cut down from the valley of Eskol a branch with a single cluster of grapes, which they carried on a pole between two of them, and also brought some pomegranates and figs. So one little cluster of grapes from the grapevine in this land that flows with milk and honey. And notice that this is down in the south part of the country, right? This is in the Negev, the hill country, the arid, dry, wilderness, wasteland. And there, the grapevines are so, the, the ground is so fertile, the grapevines are so, uh, so blessed by God that they cut down just one little cluster of grapes, and it takes two men to carry that one cluster on a large pole over their shoulders to bring it home. That's how heavy it was, right? That's how much grape juice, if they made grape juice back then, but wine they could have made. That's how much satisfaction they could have had uh, munching into those juicy Gifts from God. Just one little cluster. Think about the whole land. God's already said that this is true, but they didn't believe him. Verse 24 mentions a place was called the Valley of Eskol. Uh, it's the Hebrew for a cluster. So uh, it says that because the cluster the people of Israel cut down from, uh, from there. So uh, note the mention in verse 22 of these descendants of Anak. Uh, these were uh, the Canaanite population before the conquest. These are the, the people who were already there. Uh, perhaps uh, some have said, well, these are uh, perhaps a special kind of people that live in the land. 
Uh, Abraham buys a burial place for his wife Sarah, uh, and he, he does so from a, a family of noble, uh, noblemen uh, who are from this uh, region, as people called the Hittites. So uh, these descendants of Anak, they've already been there uh, for quite a while, and, they, uh, uh, and, and Abraham has interacted with them, perhaps. Uh, they're renowned for their size. We know the sons of Anak because later on in the story of the Bible, uh, there's going to be a very famous descendant of Anak, who is a giant, who fights battles, who wins every single time except for the last battle he ever fought. Do you know who that, that giant is in the Old Testament? Goliath, Goliath right? It's Goliath. So go read 1 Samuel chapter 17. Goliath was this son, this descendant of Anak. Uh, they can also be called that because of the size of their fortresses, the thickness of their walls. And so uh, they got this the reputation for being giant people because they hid behind giant fortresses and giant walls. I'll mention that uh, in just a bit when, when we see this report. So those, that's their, th- those are their deeds. They go into the promised land, these spies do, uh, and, they, and they scope it out. And they bring back this one cluster of grapes, so large, again, kids, so large that one cluster of grapes was hanging on a giant pole, a giant stick of wood, and it took two men to carry it on their shoulders. That's how big, that's how heavy it was. That's how blessed that promised land was. But notice the uh, the words, excuse me, the words of uh, the spies, verses 25 to 33. Numbers 13, verses 25 uh, through 33. So they've been there for 40 days, we're told there. Verse 25, 40 days, they come back. Uh, verse 26 says they show the people, all the, the, all, all the Israelites, the fruit of the land, this great big cluster of grapes. Uh, and their reports, as we read the report here, verse 27 and following, it reads like would we say something to, to someone that we care about. You know, do you want the good news first or the bad news? You want the good news or the bad news? <laughs> so it reads like that because they say they're the good news, notice. Uh, Verse 27, the land flows with milk and honey. Shocker, right? That's what God has said. He's been telling it the whole time. It flows with milk and honey as the Lord had promised back in Exodus chapter number 3. They should have expected that. They didn't need to send in spies. However, notice, however, the people who dwell in the land are strong. And the cities are fortified and very large. These descendants of Anak lived there, and one of, the way, uh, one of the reasons why they could have been known as giants was because they lived in giant fortified uh, uh, towns, cities. Uh, for example, uh, in this ancient world, uh, an ancient Canaanite wall, around this very same time as uh, Moses and Joshua, a Canaanite wall was somewhere between 30 to 50 feet high. And this is before having, you know, all the eventual battering rams and ramps and so forth. So 30 to 50 feet high. In other words, these are unscalable walls. And they were as thick as 15 feet. Without cannons, there's absolutely no way to destroy an ancient fortified city wall. So the bad news, they're giants, they're strong, their cities are fortified, they're large. And besides that, again, verse 28 says, we saw the descendants of Anak. Right? We, uh, and and, and uh, they mention also the Amalekites. They're there, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Canaanites. And if you notice there, the, the language there, the, uh, the Amalekites are in the land of the, of the Negev, that's down south. The Hittites, Jebusites, they are in the hill country. The Canaanites are by the sea, the Mediterranean, and also along the Jordan. In other words, when we go in, we're going to be surrounded. As soon as we go into the promised land, we're going to be surrounded. Enemies on every single side. Oh, you need a little faith, though. Hasn't God already said that he's with them? Didn't he already bring them out of Egypt? I mean, come on, right? So one of the things that we learned from reading our Old Testament is that these sinners, these saints were sinners, right? These, sin- these saints were sinners. They're no different than you and me. These holy men, these holy women, these patriarchs, these matriarchs, these saints, these mighty men, these prophets, these priests, these kings, they were no different than you. No different than you. 
They saw the, the power of God. They saw the miracles, the signs, the wonders. And if you and I would see a miracle, a sign, and a wonder tonight, God doing something amazing and miraculous and splitting the Pacific Ocean in two, we can walk all the way to Hawaii, we would disbelieve as soon as we got there. That's the faith, or the lack thereof, of our forefathers. But at least there is one with faith, we're told here. There's a second one, but at least now there's one, verse 30. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Here's a child of God who has heard the Lord speak, who believes the Lord, and who's willing to act. He's not just giving lip service to the, to the Lord. Oh, we worship the Lord. We don't worship Baal. We worship the Lord, yes, except when times get tough. This Caleb hears the word, he believes the word, and he's willing to act upon the word. How do we know that he had faith? By his actions. We learn later on in the New Testament, don't we? James, when he says to us, what good is it if someone says he has faith but does not do good works? Can that faith save him? Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Faith apart from works is useless. He had faith, because he, and he demonstrates it by his deeds, by his words, by his works and his attitude uh, to be one of action and to trust the Lord. Yet he's preaching this message here that we should go up at once, we should occupy the land. We are able to overcome these enemies, all these obstacles, these 50 foot high, 15 feet uh, thick walls. We can win. But apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, working inwardly, just mere preaching outwardly that goes in one ear out the other cannot change hearts and minds. The men who went up with Caleb, verse 31 says, they said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we are. They've forgotten the Lord. They forgot the Lord. When they traveled to the wilderness, how do they know the Lord was there? Go back to the last, our last message, the chapters before. When the Israelites wandered through the wilderness, how did they know the Lord was there? So in the daytime, what did they see? Pillar of smoke. And at nighttime, what did they see? Pillar of fire. All they had to do was look. And they would have seen God in their midst, but no. All they could think about was that all oh, these, these, these giants... These walls, this land. And so Moses summarizes their bad report, as it's called, that the land devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. We saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak. We seemed to be ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. Why grasshoppers, interestingly? Why, why, why do the spies say that we look like grasshoppers to these giants? Why grasshoppers? Well, it's interesting, uh, in, this, in the law of God, uh, the grasshopper was the smallest edible thing that you could eat. So the smallest edible thing you could eat was a grasshopper. And so in other words, this was a way of the, an Israelite saying, like, we, we are like edible bugs to the inhabitants of the land. We're like grasshoppers to them. So the Lord saved Israel from Egypt. He demonstrated his power and might and signs and wonders. He provided bread from heaven, water from rocks, meat in abundance we saw last time, yet they still did not believe the Lord. But those are the faithless spies, right? So 12 go in, 10 of them are faithless. Surely the people in the pews are going to have way more faith than these guys, right? What do you think? Then all the congregation raised a loud cry. What'd they say? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. They wept that night. And all the people of Israel, as we saw in the chapters just before this, they grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Again, they grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Here we go again. It's the same song and dance all over again. 
And notice while Moses made his cries and complaints to God, we saw last time, when, when we complain as believers, we do it to God, the Israelites are complaining to Moses or against Moses on a horizontal level. They're not complaining to God because they don't care about God. And they're complaining against Moses. Would that we had died in the land of Egypt. Or that we would have died in this wilderness. No water, no bread, no meat, now no graves. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives, our little ones will become a prey to the enemies. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And so they, they hatched this plan to go back. I mean, of all the places in the Old Testament that a faithful child of God would want to go back to was Egypt. You don't want to go back there. You don't want to go there. And, but they say to one another, notice verse number four, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Right? So it's going from bad to worse. Now, this is one of the things that we do too, right? This is the same temptation as is true of us. One of the things that we do in our, in our following of the Lord is that we always want to go backwards. We always want to go backwards. We've been called out of darkness into God's marvelous light. But how easily do we crawl back into the darkness when it suits our pleasures, when we're just merely tempted, when the world says it's better? How easily do we crawl back to the darkness? We've been saved by the sheer grace and mercy of Almighty God, which we've done nothing to deserve, we've done nothing to earn. We merely embrace it by faith. But as we've been looking at in our men's Bible study in Galatians, we are so quick to desert the Lord who has saved us and to go after the false gospel of works. Galatians 1 describes a Christian church. Oh, foolish Galatians, how easily, how quickly you have deserted the one who saved you. And you fall after a false gospel. That's us, right? We so easily do these kinds of things. Whether we fall back into sin, we go back into the darkness, we flee the light for darkness, or we go back into thinking that we can somehow contribute to our salvation, earn our salvation, pay back God for our salvation, whatever it might be. And we we turn our faith into works. God calls us, calls you and I, forward in faith. To follow Him through good times and bad. To, th- to follow him through all the ups and downs of this life. He's worth it. Follow him. Follow the Lord, loved ones. You don't want to go back to Egypt any more than you want to go back into your own sins. Follow the Lord. Now, the spies report the congregation is faithless as well. Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and Caleb respond. Notice the verses 4 through 10. Uh, Moses and Aaron fall on their faces before the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. Why do they fall on their face? What does that signify? The spies report they're faithless. The people are crying and weeping because God is going to kill us in the wilderness. So Moses and Aaron fall upon their faces. What does that show? Fear of what? Fear of God. What else? Uh, intercession for mercy, which we're gonna, Moses is going to do that. Uh, what else? It's, a, it's humility, isn't it? Humility. And it's, a, it's their way of distinguishing themselves in fear, in humility, in intercession for mercy from these faithless fellow congregants that they have. They fall down as an act of submission to the Lord and His will. And they worship him. Even as they're astonished they're fit, that their fellow covenant members who have gone through the wilderness, who've come out of Egypt together, they're so faithless. Most important here is the response of Joshua. We heard Caleb faithfully preaching, and now it's Joshua's turn, along with Caleb. They tear their clothes, verse 6. What does that show? In the Old Testament, when a person tears their clothes and they throw dust on their heads, what are are they trying to show? It's repentance, it's humiliation, right? Again, same thing. So they tear their clothes, right? Like you're literally exposing yourself to God. You have nothing to hide. You can't hide from Him anyway. 
And we hear their little sermon that they both give in verses 7 to 9, Joshua and Caleb. The land is an exceedingly good land, affirming what the spies have said, what God had already said. If the Lord delights in us, which he, we know he does, <laughs> He's, he delighted them. That's why he saved them. That's why he saved them. That's why when they complained and grumbled, he constantly bent over backwards and gave them the things that they needed in the wilderness. So if the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us. A land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord like you're doing right now. Do not fear the people of the land. The fear of God is stronger than the fear of man. Jesus said, don't fear those who can destroy your body. Fear the one who can destroy your soul and throw it into hell. Don't fear the people of the land. Who cares how many of them there are, how tall they are, how fortified their cities are? You have God on your side. And just like we are like grasshoppers to them, the smallest little edible little bugs and insects, they are like bread for us, ready to be devoured. Their protections are removed from them. Despite what their eyes see, these impressive fortified cities, their protection is removed from them. The, and most importantly, the Lord is with us. See that in verse number nine? The Lord is with us. Do not fear them. We've seen it throughout these first 14 now chapters, the presence of God. The presence of God with his people. If God is for us, as Paul says, as Rabbi Saul says, who can be against us? God is with us. Don't fear. So Joshua, Caleb, then preach this message, and did the church give an amen? (laughs) Man, these people are hard, aren't they? Then all the congregation said, to stone them with stones. If that ever happens here, I'm running through that back door. (laughs) Right? To stone them with stones. For preaching the truth, you will be put to death. Sounds like a little bit of a foreshadowing here, doesn't it? God is going to tell Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 18 that there's going to be a prophet greater than Moses who's going to come. And one day that greater prophet is going to come and he's going to be betrayed and he's going to be tried and he's going to be crucified for preaching that he was the way, the truth, the light. Preaching the truth doesn't always come with roses and, you know, chocolates and, you know, pats in the back and little pictures from kids, you know. Preaching the truth sometimes comes with death. But the glory of the Lord, notice this, they're going to stone them to death, but the glory of the Lord appeared, right? The cloud, the fire, just in the nick of time, verse 10. So we we begin to see here that following the Lord means being a part of a remnant of grace. Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb are this little remnant of the people of God. In addition, being a part of the remnant means being dismissed when you speak the word and persecuted for doing so. But, again, let's learn to follow the Lord, to follow him, his voice. Now, the heart of the story comes into focus, finally, in verses 11 through uh, 35. 11 to 35, the Lord's response to all of this. So far, it's been the people, Moses, Joshua, Caleb, the congregation, all this rabble. Now the Lord speaks. What does God think about all this? Right? That's the most important question of all. What does God think about all this? Moses command, the Israelites demand for spies. The spies themselves, their faith or lack thereof, their actions, the people's faithlessness, Caleb and Joshua is preaching the truth and they want to kill, kill them. What does God say about all this? Notice what he says to Moses in verse number 11. How long will this people despise me? And notice how that's paralleled with the next line. 
And how long will they not believe in me, right? That's, that's the important thing. They're faithless. In spite of all the signs that I have done among them. Sounds like what the Lord is going to say eventually when he comes to this earth. When he would come to the earth in the, from the point of view of the book of Numbers. This very same Lord was going to come one day and he was going to stand uh, over Jerusalem and say, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem! The city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Isn't it interesting that he talks about stones? How often would I have gathered you, your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. Again, you know, we think, you know, if God would just show a miracle, if God would just show a sign, I, I know that my friend, my neighbor, the person I care about the most would come to know the Lord. Not only did God do all those signs and wonders in the, Old, in the Old Testament and they saw them with their very own eyes, I mean, they literally walked on damp, dry ground through the Red Sea. They felt the mist of the waters that were heaped up. They ate bread that came out of heaven itself. I mean, they, they had miracles. They had plenty of them. But the greatest miracle of all, of course, was when, the, when God himself became human. And they still did not believe. When they saw God face to face, remember Moses saw God face to face and God spoke to Moses face to face like a friend in the temple or in the tabernacle. But eventually he would come down and not just to Moses but to everybody who could see, who had eyes to see. And those who didn't, he would heal their eyes to see God in human flesh. They still wouldn't believe. That's how hard the human heart is. That's how unbelieving we human beings can be, how stubborn, how thick-headed we can be, that when God shows up, we still don't believe it. And so he says, I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them. And I will make you, Moses, a nation greater and mightier than they. That's exactly what he said back in Exodus 32. So I mentioned at the very beginning, Exodus 32, the golden calf, and this story of the faithless spies, the only two times in the Old Testament where God threatens to wipe his people out and to start afresh with just Moses. That's how serious it was. But faithful Moses intercedes on Israel's behalf with the Lord. They're complaining just to Moses and amongst each other, and he takes his problems to God. And notice what he says to God. Of course, God knows this, but he says it anyway. Uh, the Egyptians are going to hear about this. If you wipe out Israel, and I'm the last one standing, the Egyptians are going to hear about it. And they're going to tell all the inhabitants of this promised land. These inhabitants, in fact, he goes on to say, verse 14, uh, they've heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people. And notice this. Again, the spies come back, and all they had to do was look at, the, look at the, the, the pillar of cloud and fire, and remember, oh, I forgot, God is right there in my midst, in our midst. For you, O Lord, are seen face to face, and your cloud stands over them, and you go before them in a pillar of, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Even the unbelieving nations that were surrounding the Israelites in the promised land, they saw the cloud and fire. So what would Egypt, the great power of the region, and all these lesser neighbors of theirs, what, what would they hear and say among themselves if the Lord killed the people as one man, as verse 15 describes it? Notice verse 16. It's because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land that he swore to give to them that he's killed them in the wilderness. Lord, your own reputation is the line. You've said something. We've spread this news the nations around us see and hear the things that we are doing and saying. And if you don't keep this promise, Lord, to preserve your people, to bring them into the promised land, as you've said, and you, you, yet you are, uh, but you wipe us all out, Lord, they are going to say that God, the Lord, was not able. God's own reputation, his own glory was on the line. Isn't that what Jesus did? Destroy this temple, and what did he say? In 
three days I'll raise it up. And he comes and he dies. The very glory of God was at stake on that Easter Sunday morning. But he's alive. Amen? Right? When God says it, he's going to do it. And so Moses intercedes, just like he did way back when in Exodus 33 and 34. He says, please, this is verse 17, please let the power of the Lord be, gr uh, be great as you have promised, saying, the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means will clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and the fourth generation. Where does that come from? Does that sound familiar? Moses is praying those words, but who first spoke those words? The Lord did, back in Exodus 33 and 34. The Lord preached to Moses, and Moses listened to that sermon, and he wrote those words upon his heart. And so he could pray the word of the Lord back to the Lord. And so he's applying the Lord's own promise. Please pardon, verse number 19. Please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love. Right? Steadfast love. Chesed, covenant faithfulness. God says it. He's going to do it. Just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Lord, you've been bearing up with them. Please, Lord, just one more time. One more time. So the Lord says, I've pardoned, verse 20. I've pardoned. But notice what, it, what else the Lord says. Verse 20, the Lord said, I have pardoned. What else did he say there? What was that? According to your word. This is one of those astonishing phrases. In the Old Testament, where the Lord reveals himself responding to the intercession of a human being. He threatened to wipe out Israel. Moses comes and says, Lord, pardon them. And the Lord does just that in response. How can this be? This is, this is amazing. That this God of all might and power and knowledge and wisdom, who is the end from the beginning, who is himself life, that he, that he responds to the piddly little prayers of a puny human being. God reveals himself this way from time to time to elicit a response from us, an intercession from us. It's not that God changes his mind, but that he wants us to be changed. And so he reveals himself like this. Like a parent wants to have their child do the right thing, say the right thing, live the right way, pray the right way, and so forth. Right? And so we kind of lead them on. We try to teach them not just by our own example and by putting words in their mouth, but we want to see them say those words with their own hearts. And so we kind of prompt them a little bit, lead them on. That's what God is doing here. But it also shows us that prayer and the eternal, mysterious will of God are interconnected. Can God do anything he wants that's consistent with his nature? Can God do anything that he desires that's consistent with his nature? Absolutely, he's God, right? I mean, he can't cease to exist. That's not consistent with his nature. But he can do anything, we say. God can do anything. But the amazing truth that's revealed here is that he also works through. He works through human beings and their little prayers. Not because he needs to, because he needs us because he wants to. He wants us to glorify him. He wants us to be edified. He wants us to see how connected our, our hearts are with his eternal will. And so God not only determines the end from the beginning, but he also determines the means of the end. And the way for God to forgive and pardon Israel was that Moses would intercede after God had threatened to wipe them off the face of the planet. That's what it took for Moses, for God to elicit from Moses an intercession so that God could reveal himself to be what he is, merciful and gracious and abounding in steadfast love. So he's a forgiving God. 
But he doesn't merely overlook or forget this, their sins. Their sins had consequences. He speaks really soberly, doesn't he? There, uh, chapter 14, verse 22, where he says, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice, none of them shall see the land that I swore to give to their father. So they are pardoned of their sin. The consequences, you're not going to see the promised land. Only Caleb and Joshua, as the chapter goes on to describe, would be spared of that generation. The Lord specifies that uh, these are uh, th those who are going to die are those who are listed in the census, verse number 29, uh, from 20 years old and upward, right? Remember, we looked at the very beginning, the census, the men who are 20 years old and upward. These were the, the armies of God. And so uh, this army had, uh, uh, the Lord as sort of like a general saw that his army was unfit for duty. And so he's going to put them out of their misery and he's going to retire them. And they're not going to serve him in that way. So the Lord responds, uh, his response shows us who he is, a holy God of justice and mercy. A holy God of justice and mercy. But we're still in the Old Testament, right? N Numbers is still the Old Testament. So God reveals himself in shadowy ways of his mercy and his justice. The reconciliation between God's mercy and justice have, has, has yet to come into full clarity uh, at this point in the, in the scriptures. It's only in the cross that the justice and mercy of God meet together and are reconciled. It's only in the cross where God is shown to be perfectly just, but also the perfectly just to fire of sinners. It's only in the cross where the perfect justice of God is meted out upon Christ on sinners' behalf, the sins of the world, in fact, and the perfect justification for sinners for those who simply put their trust in Jesus. So how could God overlook their sin? I mean, it just seems like he wipes their sins under the carpet. Well, he's revealing himself in this way because it's not yet time for the cross. And so he says, I'm going to pardon them, but yet I'm still, that's a God of mercy, but I'm still a God of justice, and so they're not going to see the promised land. How do these two things get reconciled? In the cross, ultimately, where God punishes Christ on our behalf, He's just because he punishes sin, takes it seriously, he doesn't overlook it and forget it, but he's also the justifier, the one who has faith in Jesus, as Paul says. So that we put our, tr our trust in Jesus and all that he did to suffer for us becomes ours. So justice for Christ, mercy for us, amen? Notice the story comes to an end then. It comes to an end, verses 36 to the end. There's a summary statement that just as the Lord said, so all those men sent to spy the land and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing up a bad report, verse 36 and verse 37, they died by plague before the Lord. In the meantime, when Moses told these words to all the people of Israel, the people mourned greatly, verse 39. So they cried. They shed tears. They mourned when Moses said this was going to happen to them. Were they sorry for their sins? These are Esau type of tears. They are mourning the loss of their inheritance. They're not mourning that they have offended God. There's a difference. Selfish sorrow mourns being caught in sin. Godly sorrow mourns sinning against God. So in their faux sorrow, notice what they do. They rise up early the next morning. They go into the heights of the hill country and they say, Here are we. We will go up to the place the Lord has promised, for we've sinned. They don't want to miss out on the land that flows with milk and honey. Moses, though, says, No. You've already transgressed the commandment of the Lord, verse 41. But most importantly, the Lord, the Lord is not among you, verse 42. And if you go up, you're going to fall by the sword. Don't go. Peril, danger, right? Nothing good is going to happen. But again, they still wouldn't believe. They wouldn't believe God when he spoke of the good stuff, the promised land. They would not believe when he threatened them death. That's how hard-hearted they were. They presumed to go up to the heights of the hill country. 
although neither the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed out of the camp, verse 44, and thus they were defeated. Period. End of story. <laughs> so we read these, these, ch these chapters, these stories. We learn some lessons here. Uh, we see some pictures and shadows of our Lord Jesus Christ here. We see lots of interesting details and fun little tidbits and Bible trivia. But how do we read stories like this you know, in, a, in a holistic way? What, what do we take away from a story like this as a believer? Well, Paul, Rabbi Saul, once wrote this to the church in Rome. He said, whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. Speaking of the Old Testament. That through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. So the Old Testament was written for us, for our benefit, for our good, for our encouragement. So we read Numbers 13 and 14, and we recognize that it was written for us who believe in Jesus Christ. But how? They were commanded to go into a physical land, to fight physical enemies with real weapons. What's the application? Vote Republican? Take the country back for Jesus? Is that the application? No. Numbers 13 through 14 was written for us in Christ. We have in the Old Testament types and shadows. We have pictures and all these figures uh, of things that are going to come, but in Old Testament kinds of ways. So they're called shadows, and there's the reality of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the types and the shadows, they are fulfilled in Christ, and they're completed in us, the people of Jesus Christ, Christians, the church. And so they were called to enter the, and to conquer and to live in that land. Again, is the application, well, you know, this is the promised land, right? We are the city that is uh, that, that shining city on the hill for the whole world. No, the church is described as having its citizenship where? Where's your citizenship, Christian? In heaven. In heaven. You've not come to that which, which may be touched, as Hebrews 12 says, but you've come to the heavenly Jerusalem. And so they were going into, into a literal land. Our citizenship is a heavenly one. They faced literal giants. These sons of Anak, the Anakim. They faced real enemies. Again, or is this the application to us to go out and kill someone for Jesus? No, absolutely not. Who are our enemies? Do we wrestle with flesh and blood? As Christians, do we wrestle with flesh and blood? Meaning, do we, do we, are we called by God to take up arms and literally fight against enemies? The last time I checked, the Apostle Paul said we don't wrestle against, uh, with flesh and blood. But we wrestle with rulers, authorities, cosmic powers of this present darkness against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. In other words, everything that puts itself up against God in this age of the new covenant, the New Testament, those are the giants that we are called to fight against, spiritual giants, and we are called to engage in a spiritual war. So our forefathers faced a physical war. Ours is a spiritual war. But we face our warfare in Christ, who entered the strong man's house of this world in his incarnation to plunder evil. And therefore, we are called to fight against Satan, our sins, and the influence of a world that is opposed uh, to Jesus Christ. Uh, as one ancient writer said, just as the fathers, the people of, uh, of Israel, trampled on the necks of the nations, so you, Christians, will also trample on the necks of demons. We don't wrestle with flesh and blood, right? It's a good reminder for us, and uh, I think we've got a, uh, what's at least called a debate uh, these days. I think, is it a debate on Thursday? Uh, we have some kind, of, some kind of a debate, a thing called a debate, uh, coming up, and we're going to be uh, put into corners like, like uh, lambs of the slaughter, you know, vote for him, vote for him, don't vote for him, don't vote for him. Uh, as if there's only two options, right? Uh, our, our enemies are not physical. Our problems are not things that we can see and touch 
and take up in our hands. We are called to grapple with and trample the necks of demons. And when we do so, when we fight in the armor of God, as Ephesians 6 goes on to describe, we arm ourselves with weapons like those, following, as uh, another writer said, our general, who is Jesus, with, without fear. So when Moses said, and Joshua said, and Caleb said, do not fear, then the Lord's with you. That finds its application in, in us, wrestling and fighting a spiritual battle. We might despair. We might despair as Christians, uh, like our forefathers did. Uh, we despair whether, we, whether the Lord can actually save us, whether He can deliver us from uh, these spiritual giants. But if we follow Jesus, and we believe in His words, and are filled with faith. These enemies in our sight are as nothing. That's what they failed to recognize. Go in because the Lord is on your side. It's the same with us. The church, we are called as Christians who are members of this church and who are members of the body of Christ, universal, we are called to fight a spiritual battle How? By following the Lord, hearing His voice in His Word, believing all that He says, and being faithful to obey. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we ask that You would grant us Your Spirit tonight to write these words upon our hearts. Help us, Lord, not to sin against You. Help us to fight uh, the good fight of faith, to wrestle with spiritual forces, uh, clothed in Christ, armed with Your Word and prayer. Uh, to do so to your glory, uh, to the salvation of the world, and for our own edification uh, and benefit. Uh, And so we ask tonight, Lord, that you would uh, hear our prayers. Help us, Lord, to fight uh, the fight that you've called us to and that you've placed us in, knowing that most of all, you are present. Uh, You are with us. Uh, No giant uh, can overcome us. And we ask this all in Jesus' name and all of God's people say, amen. Let's sing uh, the doxology in response tonight. Uh, I hope you know that one by heart. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. George, you want to lead us? Is that okay? From whom all blessings flow.